Hey everybody, Bart the Nature Guy here. Um, this week is more of a catch-up week, so I'm not going to do a, a, a camping-related skill set video. Um, we will get back into that, but uh, actually this week I have a new class starting on Friday. Last week, Friday, there was no school for students, and so I my and then in the beginning of the week there was. So this is kind of a, a wrap-up week. And last week it was kind of a wrap-up week for you all in regards to the end of the quarter. Uh, this week is kind of like a, a gathering up and making sure all my all the teaching that I do kind of keeps aligned. Uh, so I've been answering a lot of questions from students, uh, just kind of just random questions from really specific skill set things um, and, and tools I might use to um, just how did you get involved in doing what you do. So I thought I'd actually take the opportunity just to introduce myself in that arena and answer some of the questions. I, you'll see me with my hands, I talk with my hands all the time and uh, and I have this little card in here. So I have a few of the questions that students have, have asked me over the last week. thought I'd try to uh, answer a few of those for you. Um, first of which is uh, where does like I always introduce myself as Bart the Nature Guy, and um, and that's actually just from students. So that's not some like name or title I came up with. It's actually how students used to they would see me in the halls and I'd be carrying like um, like tents and like sticks and all sorts of stuff from all the stuff that I teach about. And uh, I've been bringing in, you know, like Ikea bags full of like ropes and things like that. And they'd be like, oh, you're here today. Cause I'm only at most schools once a week. I wasn't like full time at most schools. I just kind of float in from school to school. Cause I'm not just at like SEC. Um, I'm also at WEC. I'm also at um, ABAC and I'm also at uh, the Eden Prairie HTC program. And so I float around from these different schools and I just come in for one day of the week and the students were like, oh, you're the nature guy. You're that guy that goes to camping thing. And so the nature guy is kind of like what students started to call me when they'd see me in the halls loading up full of gear and walking into classes. So that's where that comes from. So it's not some big title I thought of, like the nature guy. It's just like how students remember me. So when I started doing videos uh, when COVID hit, I just started saying, oh, it's part the nature guy, just to prompt people, because I'm not like a regular staff person that you see at school every day. Uh, so it's, it's easy to forget that I'm around. Um, obviously, it, it, you know, like I'm only there for like an hour with, with most students uh, once a week. Um, and so that's how I introduced myself. And so uh, that's how kids would say hi to me in the halls and be like, they wouldn't remember my name. Um, they would just remember you're the nature guy. So that's where that comes from. Uh, but my, I've worked in schools for many, many years. So I worked in a lot of more of like trauma and abuse stuff. Um, so how I kind of came to working in schools, it came through working with like people that would get in fights a lot or sexual harassment, like kind of just didn't understand boundaries around like dating stuff. So if a couple was really arguing back and forth all the time at school, uh, the school would have like a, like if you imagine like a social worker at a school, they might have one, someone that helps, uh, they might have like a specialist that works with like addiction stuff. And then they might have a specialist that works like homelessness. Um, myself and then the staff I coordinated, and, and we were in many more schools than 287. So we were at Kennedy, Jefferson, Richfield, Eden Prairie, Dinah, St. Louis Park. We were also at Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, like up kind of up in the north as well with the program that I coordinated. And those social workers would use us for, for referring students around uh, maybe violence or abuse at home. Uh, and needing more advocacy stuff. So not not as therapeutic as much, but more just daily tangible strategies to get through the day. Uh, and we would work side by side with therapists and, and the social workers at school to make sure that student was getting the needs that they needed met. Um, so there's kind of like the somebody that was going through bad stuff, but there's also the side of it that people were doing bad things. So um, like fighters and stuff like that. So I was oftentimes referred to, I went from before for many years, I was the anger guy. Um, Cause I dealt with all the kids that would struggle with anger at school. And so they would see me in the lunchroom like, that's my anger management guy. So that's what I would do. Um, but after 20 years, I left that work, um, about 20 years, uh, and focused, decided to focus more on wellness. So uh, the I started to focus more in the area of like, good and thinking of like positive things and and that's kind of what I took away from my work at where I where I worked at per previously at Cornerstone um, I wanted to focus more on like wellness so I actually became a yoga instructor um, really found the benefits of what what did I see was working with students that I was working with on anger what what helped them reduce their stress because they a lot of times they were just stressed out and that would carry out into behaviors at school that was a struggle for them and, and yoga was definitely one of those things that I said, you know, that's a real tangible thing that somebody can do to, to help re reduce stress. And I also started to really study the outdoors and actually being outside. When you're in space, it's not right angle. Like there's hardly any right angles here right now. And that actually helps our eyes 
relax a little bit. And it's been studied by science. And so I, I knew that nature always had a benefit. And then as an anger management person at school, a lot of times, and you may have this at your school, like if a kid gets really upset and angry, a lot of times they'll take them outside for a walk. And I was like, I don't think it's the conversation. I think it's the outside doing the work. And actually forest therapy guiding was a perfect fit for me. So I actually became a certified forest therapy guide as well. Um, the idea is that I'm the guide. This stuff behind me, that's the therapist. So the forest gets to be the therapist and I get to be the guide and open doors and provide invitations to people to engage in nature and I'll let nature do the work. Um, I'm just simply a kind of a conduit. Um, it's kind of the concept of, around the work that I do in uh, using nature uh, as kind of the tool or the, the, the way to get someone uh, to maybe look at things in a little bit different way or provide just that stress reduction. It really does reduce stress. The, the science, science has proven it. Um, it's been really studied in Japan and some of the Scandinavian countries. And the U.S. is also definitely coming around uh, in regards to its research around what are the benefits of what's happening out here. Um, not only just what we breathe in, some of the benefits of actually being in nature and what we take in, also just our eyes, the stress reduction, having some space, and getting out of those linear right angle spaces that we have um, inside buildings a lot. Um, and just giving yourself a break as well and, and giving yourself that time in the day uh, to say I'm going to take 10 minutes and step outside. Uh, I think that's really uh, an important place for people to say I'm going to step out. If it, it, it's not always possible. If you're in a class you can't always do it. So um, there's other stress reduction tools that I would kind of help with students. Now what happened a few years ago was actually where a there was a teacher that left and they needed um, somebody to help out with a class and uh, and because I was doing this kind of outdoor stress reduction stuff they didn't want me to teach that because I was already doing it they're like can you help with a kind of a different subject can you is there something you could work with on the kids um, that would kind of be outdoors related I was like well I love to camp and I've been outside my whole life and that's where I find the most peace in my life and so I was like how about I teach like how to camp like a camping 101 and they're like that sounds great we only need it for eight weeks we're going to get a new hire in here this is going to be awesome uh yeah if you could just fill that gap we'll have a you know, teacher in with you but if you could kind of take the lead on that that would be awesome and so i started to create kind of a uh a, an idea of like what did i want to do like teaching tents what else do you need to know you need to know how to do knots you need to know how to camp and i started to develop the kind of this eight week program for this little absentee gap where a, a teacher had left the building uh, and they're still a beloved teacher in the district. They just switched from one building in 287 to another. And, uh, but the students loved it. And the staff said, this is really great. Can you do it the, the next quarter? And instead of doing eight, can you do 16 weeks and kind of do the whole rest of the semester? And that's where this whole camping thing came from. Um, and my background is, I grew up as a as a as a cam like a cabin kid in northern Minnesota. Spent every weekend outdoors, um, growing up, starting fires every morning. Um, I was a kid that just fished constantly and so I was always in a boat and always seeing nature and always enjoyed nature um, and then as I got in my adulthood did some backpacking as well I've had a few trips uh, primarily through like um, fishing trips and stuff like that where I've been way up in the, like near the Arctic Circle I've uh, been in northern Canada a couple times I've been in Alaska for trips uh, I think I've been there three times uh, and, and got some great road trips in and I also used to uh, play a sport called disc golf and disc golf provided me an opportunity to do tons of car camping so we'd show up at these towns to play these tournaments and it would be kind of a crew of us and in order to save money we would just simply um, like camp instead of get a hotel and so we would have these times where we would just get really good at car camping and so I have tons of experiences through not only from my childhood but also through my 20s and 30s um, go backpacking um, going on kind of adventures where I had places to stay, but I also would do huge kind of epic adventures during the during the day. Um, even though I came, you know, would return at night. I've had some long, like you know, 30 mile loops um, on backpacking that I've done. I've done extended time outdoors as well. So, uh, but I just I love being outdoors, and so that's how it all kind of started. So I had a, kind of a, a good solid knowledge base obviously with as this has taken off I've done a lot more studying and research making sure that I'm getting the proper information to you all and learning from some of uh, the other experts out there in the world there's lots of people that love to do the similar thing to what I do so there's lots of uh, programs like National Outdoor Leadership, Outward Bound, 
Um, you might have had like wilderness inquiry come into your school and do like kind of a one day program. Um, what I like to do is introduce nature on a continual basis um, and then kind of introduce camping. And the idea for all the students is there, I just want to introduce things that for some students it's very common to be in a camping situation. For other students it's very uncommon and if that opportunity comes up, at least you have a familiarity with some of the, the tools, the tactics and strategies to, to make that trip successful for you. So, uh, and also, loving the outdoors so um and i have some other questions as well but that's kind of how i got started with it um i just wanted to kind of give you an overall a little bit about who i am what i do and how i got here so uh, but many years in the district primarily working with more trauma related stuff uh and then kind of focused uh, more on wellness and then that kind of flipped into the camping wilderness survival stuff so uh and have like i said i have lots of just kind of background experiences that have just come up over the years of years of being outside um so I'm going to ask, um, what's the grossest thing I've ever eaten was one of the questions. And uh, I've definitely eaten a couple things outside. I try to be pretty safe. So the, the general rule around foraging out there, if you're going to pick stuff off the ground or in a tree or berries or roots, you, you can't be 100% positive. You have to be 200% positive. You'll hear that from me all the time. And I am not even a master forager. I, I can forage. Um, but there are people, it's more of like an apprentice relationship. So if you think of like being a carpenter or electrician, um, anything like that, a plumber, you have like an apprenticeship to learn the process, hands on with somebody that's an expert. Um, if you are interested in, in foraging and finding food in the forest, um, different than like hunting and fishing, but if you're looking for like mushrooms and, and like all the different things that you can find, nuts and berries in the woods, I really encourage you to, to really look up like Minnesota foragers, find somebody that can apprentice you and learn that skill set um, so you can be very positive in what you're eating. You, if you can put stuff in your body that will make you absolutely sick, unbearable, and possibly death. So um, I have eaten a mushroom that I thought was uh, a certain mushroom. Uh, it was not, and it definitely did not taste good when I ate it. I knew it was gross, and I got out of my mouth right away. It was gross. So I was like, that's not something that anybody would want to eat. I don't know why I thought it was that the mushroom that I thought it was, but gross. Um, so that would probably be the, the grossest thing. Um, I do uh, eat a lot of, of, of fish and other things that I, other game that I get. Um, and you have to make sure you cook those properly as well. So I, through my 20s, as I was learning to cook as an adult, I've definitely had some weird meals um, that I put together for myself. So um, let's see here. Oh, scariest story. So a lot of them tend to be like worst case scenario questions. So we'll, we'll just go with that. Um, some of you may have heard some of these stories before because I have been teaching for a few years. But um, one is a scary story from the outdoors. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, I was in uh, south of Jackson Hole in Wyoming, so in the Palisades area, um, and I got in some nasty, they call it like scree, which is like a lot of rocks that are just kind of formed together. It's kind of like where avalanche shoots come through, and I got on rocks that are like, I don't know, like small, like fist size kind of, and but it was just thousands, like as far as you could see up, and it gets really nasty and scary in there because if that, if like the whole, the, you almost feel like the whole thing could shift like a, like a rock avalanche. Um, and I got really nervous in there and I was really looking for what I could hold on to and not get myself in a, in a situation where I like my foot slips out and starts the whole thing going. So um, I had gotten myself up onto a ridge in the Palisades and I was trying to get, they call it the rim, um, and I was trying to get on top of the rim and it was just like, it just got dicey. I got really nervous. I was like, this could end really sour. And so um, I was thankful that I found roots and trees to kind of hold on to so I made sure my foot didn't slip. Um, would I choose a different route next time? Yeah, but a lot of times in the outdoors you're, you're just kind of having to deal with what nature provides you and so that was the route that I chose to take. Um, I had some people also that I knew were waiting for me on the other side so I also had some, kind of a deadline so I kind of pushed in a way that maybe if I was by myself and didn't have those other people I may, maybe would have chosen a different route. Um, but I did have kind of a responsibility to getting to them as well. And I knew this was the way to go. Um, but looking back on it, it was great. I loved being to the top, like when I got to the top of the rim and I could look out and it was just like miles upon miles of, of nature with, you know, like no roads, no telephone poles, no cell, you know, like no cell to towers anywhere. It was beautiful. I'm so glad I got to the top, but it was, uh, it was, it was a, it was a little dicey for a while. So, um, let's see here. 
Uh, people ask me about bears and animals all the time. Uh, I just, this last week, just came up on some really fresh wolf tracks, so they were definitely there within probably the 24 or 48 hours of me being there. And they're big, man. Like, I don't know if you can get, like, they're, they're, their paws are like you're looking at like a, a much more over a you know like between like 80 to a you know 150 pound animal like they're big and i don't expect their paws to be that big but every time i see them it still kind of takes your breath away because they're really de designed those timber wolves uh, that we have here in minnesota they're really designed to, to hunt on snow and so they need that big that big paw to stay up on top of the snow if they're going to be chasing things down like deer or moose or anything like that um you know right now they're actually thinking that they're they're actually hurting the uh beaver population quite a bit so they're actually starting to take out some of the beavers as well and so they're hunting in marshes and stuff like that so um so just something to kind of keep in mind is like those wolves are here in minnesota um they're probably the predator that we're going to run into the most there's very 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 few run-ins with humans like being attacked by wolves though they will definitely scare you but they don't want to be around you i don't want to be around them kind of cool to see but um but the more interactions that we have as humans with wolves it tends to desensitize them to being around humans too so as they kind of come from canada and kind of dropped into the Wisconsin and, and Minnesota and their populations tend to be growing here uh, we're gonna see more interactions with them and that concerns me in regards to the number of, of wolves that will kind of get used to humans and, and anytime like big predators bears mountain lions um, and wolves uh, have more run-ins it generally doesn't turn out too good for the animal um, and so usually the, the DNR police will have to do something uh, to remove that animal, um, tranquilize it and remove it, um, or if it's actually a danger to humans, they, they will usually um, put that animal down um, because it's now, once it has an interaction with a human, they know it benefits them uh, to interact with humans, that can get dangerous at certain, at certain times. So uh, I get kind of concerned for the, the wolf population here. Uh, black bears in Minnesota uh, tend not to be uh, th that scary because um, Minnesota black bears tend to be about I don't know 200 to 400 pounds I mean I'm a 200 pound person so um, when they see us we're pretty equal um, we're also stand kind of tall and we're up and so as long as you make yourself big and you keep yourself backing away and staring at them yelling at them letting them know that you're there um, just don't turn and run um, that's kind of the biggest concern is that you turn yourself into prey when you turn and run they they eat things that run from them so as soon as you start running it kind of flips their brain into a spot where they're like a little bit more like oh okay I chase things that do that so deer run from them so it's you know all most of the animals that they would eat you know black bears in Minnesota are like kind of giant raccoons and so they uh, tend to forage a lot they eat a lot of different things big and small so uh, and uh, western grizzlies are probably the, the most dangerous for for us I mean the, there's the big bears out in Alaska and I've definitely been around them seen them uh, but they are ten. They tend to be really fish oriented. So I mean, fish are like ten pounds. So, um, but those last or the western grizzlies in the Rockies can get pretty, pretty tough because they're eating things like elk and deer and moose and things that are my size. <laughs> and so um, that that definitely changes the equation. So I mean, definitely those grizzlies out there. Um, you know, the, the Alaskan brown bears and Alaskan black bears definitely do eat um, things that are, are large like that. But remembering their primary source of their diet tends to be salmon and fish um, we don't look like that um, but we do have a, a similar size to um, deer and and moose and elk and that sort of thing so we do take that characteristic on it can definitely be uh, something you have to be really wary of um, I do suggest always have a bear spray with you um, in that situation bear spray you don't have to try to aim it right or anything you just spray it you can spray yourself and make yourself really not tasty so but it is you know, I mean it's a big can of mace and it's nasty stuff so if anybody wants to go watch that old bear spray video I had a bunch of old cans of uh, bear spray that kind of expired and I uh, sprayed them and so there's a video out there on the YouTube channel that uh, that shows the, these really bad cans of spray which means you always have to remember to buy fresh spray every once in a while so uh, just kind of keep that in mind let's see here um, somebody asked me about like um, supplies and where do I get stuff or like like where does all this stuff come from number one it's just years and years of, of just picking up little things but i'm a deal hunter so you know i love going into like 
Goodwills and Value Villages and stuff like that and seeing what's around. There's great tarps out there. There's great um, utensils and cooking supplies. Um, Coleman, like those kind of two burner Coleman stoves that I teach cooking on, you can find those for like less than like $10, $15 sometimes in those stores. And you can find all the silverware you want in the world at a, at a Value Village or Goodwill for next to nothing. Just like, it's almost like garage sale sh shopping. So I really encourage you to, to use garage sales um, in your area, see what you can pick up and, and just pick up those things as, as needed. Um, tents can be super fun to, to hunt down. Um, I love looking at also offhand shops. There's uh, kind of like secondhand stores or um, old merchandise stores. It would kind of be similar to clothing stores like a, um, a Marshalls, um, you know, or like and you'll see them. In, there's one in Richfield for those students that are in SEC. Sierra um, is another kind of brand it shows they basically carry this stuff that's like a year or two old um, and they kind of do a it's not a resale it's brand new material but it's kind of like off the their, the current market for the company and so you can kind of get it for reduced cost so um, and then somebody asked about like military surplus I, I don't use military surplus too much I love it for utensils and stuff like that um, a lot of the tents backpacks tend to be pretty heavy um, because it's, they're usually what they sell for military surplus is like infantry stuff and so um, I, uh, with the infantry stuff, it's not like special ops. Um, so people have a lot of questions um, for that. So uh, with special um, ops, they can get really specific, get really light gear, it's specially designed for them and you get really high quality packs. Those bigger kind of um, packs tend to be cloth, um, not waterproof. Um, the boots tend to be a little bit heavier. So, uh, but some people love it. They've, they've done military it's very familiar with them they feel super comfortable in it um, I did not spend time in the military so I don't have that familiarity with it I have familiarity with more camping related gear so and some of the brands that you'll see so um, the other thing I would suggest also if you kind of are looking military surplus um, which it can be great again but I will tell you, I really caution you to get into, like some of those sites on military surplus stuff get into lots of odd stuff like ninja throwing stars and like katana blades, you know, like samurai swords and like lots of like violent and kind of odd stuff that you'll find on there that kind of goes down this um, more like a, I don't know, it's kind of like video game come to, it's like Mortal Kombat come to life kind of stuff. You know, and, and, that, and that stuff can get you just down a weird wormhole where, you know, you keep like searching, you're like, oh, that's what I need. And you're like, dude, you don't need an eight pointed throwing star. Like nobody needs that thing. You know, there's very few people on the planet. Point, point, zero, 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 one. Ninjas need that. And so um, I'm not gonna be using that in the woods in any way. So I just really costed you, if you're gonna visit army, sur like military surplus, um, sites um, looking for materials please be very wary of kind of the weird like wormhole you can get down um, when you're looking at those things in, in regards to like kind of the prepper um, survivalist is more the conqueror of nature um, I tend to try to embrace and be a part of nature and be in more of a, a symbiotic relationship with the with the surroundings a lot of that stuff tends to be like I'm gonna come in and survive and I we, you know like and there's kind of the or you can thrive in nature versus survive um, and I try to work in that out of that kind of thriving concept and thrive within nature and be more in relationship with it so um, let's see here any other questions um, have I ever been lost yes <laughs> and it can get scary really fast especially if the temperatures are dropping or the or the or the light is dropping and you're towards the afternoon and you're like the sun's gonna go down this is gonna get funky real fast um, and so you have to really know to get your ego out of it and say yeah I am lost that's the number one thing you can do is just say stop don't make yourself more lost um, and so that's what I'd say it's just stop don't make yourself more lost backtrack if you can the lovely part about winter is we have tracks so if you can go back through your own tracks you, you definitely know you're gonna find your way home even if it's a lot of miles but at least you feel safe you know you're on the right track because it's your you're following your own footprint back um, and if you can do that in the woods, that's great by kind of rustled leaves. Um, but you have to spend some time to get used to tracking um, to see like what your footprint does to leaves and how that how you can actually follow your trail back. But you gotta you gotta study that and, and be around it a lot to understand um, how your how your footprint to, like makes marks in in basically off trail without actually having snow there. So uh, you. 
you know, that's where having a compass, having that kind of small emergency pack, having that compass, which is why I teach it, having a little bit of food, having uh, some sort of light with you so in case it does get dark. That's why I kind of go through those things for you all. So if you do get lost, and obviously most of the time we have cell coverage and that's going to be a huge help as well, not only for the map, but also calling for help if you need it. So not only calling friends or family, if you're like out at a spot where you know they're, you know, you're at a campground, you're like, I'm lost, I don't know where I am. And you can call your, you know, call your folks or whatever, the person that you're with and say, I need some help getting out of here. Or you can call like a 911 and say, I'm, I'm really in, in trouble here and I need some help to get out. I don't know where I am. So uh, in Minnesota, for the most part, we have quite a bit of cell coverage for that, um, depending on your service. Um, but if you don't, that's why you always have those little packs that I've gone through before. And, and I'll be doing that soon too um, and, and going back through that again. So I want to say thank you everybody for uh, hanging out with me for a little bit. Um, this video is getting long, so I'm going to cut it short. We'll have a lot more conversation in classes. Bart, the nature guy. Peace out. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.